It's a warm summer night in the year 2010. You look out of your window to see an outside world illuminated by the familiar warm glow of sodium lighting. Whether you like the golden yellow color of the street lights or not, they are accepted as the most efficient form of lighting on Earth, boasting ten times the efficiency of traditional incandescent lighting. This is all about to change, however, as the very concept of lighting efficiency was being examined under a new light. A key factor in measuring the efficiency of any light source is its spectral output relative to the spectral sensitivity of the human eye. The human eye is more sensitive to certain wavelengths of light than others, with peak sensitivity being in the yellow range. The spectral sensitivity of the human eye is a primary reason for the efficiency of sodium lighting, as the spectral output of sodium lighting closely matches the peak sensitivity of our vision. Human vision is an incredibly versatile tool that allows us to perceive the outside world in great detail. One of the mechanisms that enables this versatility is the presence of two primary classes of light-sensing cells in our eyes. Cone cells provide photopic vision, primarily used in bright environments. Photopic vision is sharp and allows us to see different colors. Rod cells provide scotopic vision, primarily used in the dark. While scotopic vision gives us the sensitivity to see under starlight, this mode of vision is blurry and colorless. Finally, Cone cells and rod cells have different spectral sensitivities. Recalling from earlier, cone cells are most sensitive to yellow light. Rod cells, on the other hand, are most sensitive to greenish-blue light. Now let's take a look at these cells within the eye. Cone cells inhabit the center of our eyes, an area known as focal vision. Rod cells begin to appear outside of the central region and provide peripheral vision. While the region of focal vision is fairly narrow, its useful size is increased through saccadic eye movements. These movements are directed around objects of interest, building a larger area of focal vision. While this may sound complicated, understanding these two cell classes is the basis of studying visual performance at night. The installation of roadway lighting is governed by lengthy technical documents and standards designed with an unfortunately limited basis on research in a variety of fields related to lighting and vision. Up until the 1990s, photopic spectral sensitivity was the accepted metric for roadway lighting. This practice favored yellow wavelengths of light, leading to the wide adaptation of sodium streetlights. The low-pressure sodium lamp was invented during the 1930s and found widespread use in the United Kingdom with limited use elsewhere, despite being the most efficient light source on Earth. High-pressure sodium lighting was invented during the 1960s and became the most common form of outdoor lighting after the 1970s oil crisis increased global energy prices. Beginning in the 1990s, however, two new sources of lighting emerged. Metal halide was a modification of mercury lighting, turning its pale green glow into a whiter source of light with the use of additional elements in the discharge tube. Prior to high-pressure sodium, mercury lighting was the global standard for outdoor lighting. Magnetic induction lighting was a less familiar concept. Rather than using internal electrodes to energize a gas into emitting light, induction lighting used external magnets to induce an electrical current inside the discharge tube. Without the issue of internal electrodes becoming corroded, induction lighting systems can run for upwards of 100,000 hours. With a discharge tube similar to that of fluorescent lighting, magnetic discharge lamps produce a relatively white light. These new sources of light prompted lighting standards institutions to conduct new research on the efficiency of lighting. You see, simply using the photopic sensitivity curve to quantify roadway lighting was a bit of an issue. Our rod cells, responsible for night vision, are most sensitive to blue light. On paper, it became apparent that simply using the photopic sensitivity curve that favored yellow light was producing inaccurate standards for nighttime lighting. To remedy this issue, a different type of vision had to be examined, mesopic vision. Mesopic vision is a combination of photopic and scotopic vision. It covers the range of luminance in which both cone cells and rod cells are active to varying degrees. In ideal circumstances, mesopic vision grants us the sensitivity of rod cells in dark regions of the visual field and the clarity of cone cells in bright regions. 
As we will see later, however, artificial nighttime lighting doesn't make for ideal circumstances, especially for rod cells. For two decades, a series of laboratory experiments were conducted to study visual performance. The goal of this research was to determine what wavelength of light was most effective for roadway lighting. By 2010, this research had produced two primary models. The Illuminating Engineering Society of North America produced the Unified Model on Mesopic Photometry. The International Commission on Illumination, based in Europe, produced the Mesopic Optimization of Visual Efficiency, shortened to the MOVE model. For the purpose of this video, we will focus on the MOVE model as it is the more thorough of the two. To produce the MOVE model, tests were conducted to examine three metrics of visual performance the ability to notice an object, the reaction time to an object, and the ability to identify an object. These tests were performed in tightly controlled laboratory conditions where subjects were only exposed to the luminance level being tested. Additionally, subjects were given as long as half an hour for their eyes to adapt to the luminance levels being examined. The tests found that blue light offers improved peripheral visual performance up to 0.6 candela per square meter, a measure of luminance. For focal vision, however, these new tests did not find any advantage for blue light. This can be explained by the structure of the eye, where yellow-sensitive cone cells provide focal vision and blue-sensitive rod cells provide peripheral vision. Ultimately, the test results of the MOVE model did not offer much reason to change the standards for outdoor lighting. Additionally, there were several barriers between the results of these tests and their application to the real world. Despite the lack of groundbreaking results, the lighting industry and its customers were looking for change. This is where a new concept came into existence, the scotopic to photopic ratio. This ratio was used to quantify the balance of wavelengths best suited to scotopic vision and those suited to photopic vision from a specific light source. For example, a bluish-white LED would have a high scotopic to photopic ratio, while a golden-yellow sodium lamp would have a low scotopic to photopic ratio. Before we find out how this ratio was used to justify the installation of an LED streetlight outside your window, we must first understand visual adaptation. Visual adaptation is a series of processes in which our eyes adjust in order to see at different levels of light. What's important to note is that adaptation differs between cone cells and rod cells. When undergoing adaptation, rod cells take five minutes to surpass the minimum sensitivity of cone cells, while full adaptation to starlight can take as long as an hour. Additionally, rod cells are sensitive to bright sources of light and react with a process called bleaching. During bleaching, the photopigment within rod cells becomes transparent, rendering the rod cell incapable of perceiving light. Bleaching happens virtually instantly, and once complete, the lengthy process of adaptation must start all over again. In our nighttime world, there is rarely if ever an illuminated surface without a visible light source. There are often dozens of streetlights, security lights, and oncoming headlights within our field of vision while driving at night. These sources of light make it difficult, if not impossible, for rod cells to adapt and provide scotopic vision. This makes the use of scotopic vision unreliable at best on roadways at night, eliminating the reported advantages of blue light. This technicality wouldn't make it through to final reports and lighting standards, however, being drowned out by the idea of saving energy and improving safety. In roadway lighting standards, luminance targets generally range between 0.3 and 2.0 candela per square meter. Mesopic visual performance models were used to compare an LED light with a scotopic to photopic ratio of 2.0 against a high-pressure sodium lamp with a ratio of 0.65. These models determined that the luminance level needed from the LED was 20 to 27 percent lower than the luminance level needed from the sodium lamp when the photopic target was 0.3 candela per square meter. This reduction in photopic luminance is based on the assumption that rod cells are fully activated and contributing to visual performance at all times, something that isn't true in the real world. 
Following the original laboratory test results, the models determined that there was no efficiency advantage for LEDs above 0.6 candela per square meter. In a 2010 standards document, the International Commission on Illumination stated that mesopic multipliers should only be used for roadways with a speed limit of 40 km per hour or less. It was determined that at higher speeds, peripheral vision was less important and focal vision should be favored. Despite these two factors limiting the use of the scotopic to photopic ratio, the lighting industry was about to become a wild west of LED marketing. Remember that luminance reduction value of 27%? It didn't include the efficiency of the light sources themselves. In 2010, high-pressure sodium lamps could reach 150 lumens per watt, while LED streetlights struggled to achieve 80 lumens per watt. Taking this into account, the lighting industry determined that anywhere from 30% to 70% was reasonable. That's right, a mathematically less efficient light source was now being marketed with promises of using 70% less energy. Municipal policy was quick to follow, with cities and towns mandating the transition to LED street lights on all roadways at all luminance levels. Completely missing was any form of context for the scotopic to photopic ratio, such as visual adaptation never mind the limits imposed by its own creators. Results were mixed. Some individuals claimed that the new LED streetlights looked brighter, while others complained that they looked darker. The most common complaint was glare, so much glare that some people were driven to wear sunglasses at night. Thanks to aggressive marketing, the belief that these new LED streetlights were more efficient and offered better visibility was widely accepted. As we have just seen, however, the truth wasn't as simple or appealing. These new LED streetlights saved energy by illuminating a smaller area to a lower level of luminance. This lower level of luminance was justified by the scotopic to photopic ratio, a concept born from laboratory tests that didn't represent the real world. Unfortunately, things only get worse from here as we begin to examine other factors such as glare, weather impacts, the aging of our eyes, and the spectral reflectance of road surfaces. There are two types of glare, discomfort glare and disability glare. Discomfort glare is a subjective sensation ranging from barely noticeable to physical pain. Discomfort glare often leads to glare aversion responses, such as a driver turning their head away from oncoming headlights. Disability glare is an objective measure of glare based on the scattering of light within our eyes. When light scatters within our eyes, it creates a physical wall of light that obstructs our vision. In both discomfort and disability glare, shorter wavelengths of light produce more glare. One of the primary reasons for this is Rayleigh scattering, the scattering of light within small particles. When Rayleigh scattering is examined, short wavelengths of light scatter more than longer wavelengths do. This makes warmer sources of light more favorable if glare is to be avoided. Weather plays a major role in visibility and driving, often having negative impacts. Rayleigh scattering once again plays a role here, with cooler wavelengths of light scattering within weather particles more than longer wavelengths. Notice in this image how the LED streetlights produce a visible wall of light, obstructing vision. These sodium streetlights, on the other hand, experience much less of this effect. Another factor introduced by weather is the increased luminance level of roads. Roads covered in water, snow, and ice reflect more light and often act as mirrors for a direct reflection of streetlights. This increase in luminance acts against rod cells being able to adapt and contribute to vision. As we can see, there are many barriers between blue-rich light efficiency and real-world visual performance. Many nations today are experiencing a rapidly growing population of seniors, many of which are driving. The aging of the eye has a significant impact on its spectral sensitivity. As the eye ages, the lens begins to fade and yellow. This yellowing greatly reduces the amount of blue light that is able to pass through the lens onto the retina. By the age of 65, the amount of blue light passing through the lens drops by over 50% compared to someone aged 25. For example, we can compare a 4000K neutral white LED with a 2700K warm white LED. Their scotopic to photopic ratios are 1.47 and 1.28 respectively. 
Despite a mere difference in ratio of 0.19, 7% less light from the bluer 4000K LED reaches the retina of someone aged 50. A similar effect resulting in the loss of blue light is the spectral reflectance of road surfaces. Materials do not reflect all wavelengths of light evenly. Some colors of light are reflected better than others. It is this light that reflects off of the road surface and into the viewer's eye that allows them to see, so studying the spectral reflectance of the road surface is important. In a study examining over 20 different samples of road surface, it was found that warmer wavelengths of light are better reflected than bluer wavelengths. In extreme cases, amber light at 600 nanometers was reflected at twice the rate of 400 nanometer blue light. To summarize, there is a great disconnect between research relevant to outdoor lighting and those who are in charge of regulating outdoor lighting. The theory of blue light efficiency relies on the assumption that rod cells are active in artificially illuminated outdoor environments. This assumption has never been proven, making the inclusion of scotopic vision in regulating outdoor lighting completely unfounded. Additionally, a wide range of other factors reveal additional benefits of yellow-amber lighting. Under yellow-amber lighting, glare is minimized, weather impacts are minimized, vision for seniors is maximized, and road surfaces reflect more light. This leaves one final question unanswered. Why did many people find LED streetlights brighter? While we can't answer for everyone, we can examine two possible answers. The first factor is the psychology of brightness itself. Our perception of brightness is rarely, if ever, an accurate measure of luminance. Instead, it is more closely related to contrast within the visual field and glare. With both LED and sodium light fixtures exceeding the limit for visual adaptation, visual contrast is determined by the illuminated surfaces. The lower level of roadway luminance under an LED fixture can cause the LED itself to appear brighter in contrast leading to the perception of an overall brighter scene. The second factor is much simpler, so simple in fact that you will be left wondering how it can be ignored so often. Luminaire dirt depreciation is the industry term for dirt buildup reducing the output of a light fixture. To put it simply, a piece of glass left outside for 50 years won't let as much light through as a new piece of glass. The IES estimates an annual rate of dirt depreciation ranging between 1 and 4% for LED fixtures. When examined closely, many sodium light fixtures contain physical piles of dirt. Just imagine how much dimmer the inside of your home would be if its windows were this dirty. Despite this fact, municipalities often credit new LED fixtures for making their roads appear brighter. In reality, the majority of this difference could simply be a result of the LED fixtures being new. We are now over a decade into the transition to LED lighting, the nighttime world being significantly changed. Despite everything that has happened, we can still work towards outdoor lighting that is guided by thorough research rather than optimistic theories and aggressive marketing. Thank you for watching this video. A full list of peer-reviewed research and technical documents can be found linked in the description. Be sure to check out this video for a more lengthy review of LED streetlights.